So thank you for coming to the presentation. I'm going to give you some quick highlights of um, Midas Gold and its Stibnite Gold Project in central Idaho in the western United States. Uh, this is a former gold producing district. You can see one of the historical open pits here. Uh, produced over a million ounces of gold, but suffered from fragmented land ownership um, where there were multiple owners within small areas. And so that pit, just above the words where it says, um, um, Gold project is uh, like right here. That was the property boundary historically, so that's why the mining stopped because they couldn't expand outside uh, onto somebody else's land. So in 2009 through 2011, we consolidated all that land ownership into one package and now control the entire district. I'm going to make some forward looking statements, so um, you know, just be aware of those as I go forward. Um, this is a sort of a summary of the capitalization of the company, our current issued shares. Um, are here, but note we do have a convertible note uh, out. Uh, that convertible note is 0.05% interest rate, seven year money, and we can force redemption after four years. Um, so you should really kind of focus on the, you know, this being converted as well. It's in the money, um, you know, and uh, you know, we'll inevitably force conversion of that. So this is the fully diluted, including these uh, share capitalization, and we have some very strong large scale backers. So. 25% of the shares would be owned by Paulson & Co., the big New York uh, hedge fund, 12% uh, by Barrick. But Barrick currently owns 19.9%, and they would be able to exercise an anti-dilution clause if this was converted to bring their shareholds, share position back up to 199 um, We also have tech uh, as a significant shareholder, and then we have a good chunk of uh, significant uh, institutional shareholders. Um, uh, as well from M&G in the UK, big fund there, uh, Franklin and Sun Valley out of the US, Van Eck, et cetera. So very strong shareholder register that's been very supportive. So turning to the project itself, um, uh, it's, as I said, it's located in central Idaho. Um, uh, it's produced about a million ounces of gold historically. Uh, and so we're in a very geopolitically stable environment, uh, obviously in the United States, but even within the United States, you know, Idaho's ranked, uh, you know, between number five and number seven in the year in years of, of the 50 states in the United States. Um, has a big silver mining district up here. That's the one of the largest, I think, the second largest silver producing district in the world. Uh, up here, still in production today. And then you have a, the second biggest phosphate producing district down in the southeast here. Uh, so you have a long mining history here, going back to the beginning of, of the state. What do we have? Um, we have a very substantial resource uh, with 6.6 .6 million ounces of gold and uh, over 200 million pounds of antimony, and I'll come back to antimony in a minute, in resource, of which 4.6 million ounces of gold is in reserve. It's between three open pits, um, and this is the star of the show. This is the largest. It's the highest grade. It's got the lowest strip ratio. It's got the best metallurgy, et cetera. So this is the one that really drives the economics. This resource that you see here is the updated resource. So this is post the pre-feasibility study that I'm going to talk in a minute. Um, so since the pre-feasibility study, we've seen gold grade go up, antimony grade go up, et cetera. So there'll be some benefits coming from that updated resource estimate. So we did this pre-feasibility study in 2014. Um, it shows a 340,000 ounce a year gold mine, 4 million ounces of total production over the life of mine. That's 12 years of production. Um, initial capital is just under a billion dollars. This is a big mine. It's 20,000 tons a day. Um, and an after tax 19% uh, uh, rate of return and $800 million MPV. But keep in mind, this is based on the old US tax rates, which are 35%. The, the current tax rates are 21%. Round numbers, if you updated the study to change the tax rate, it would add about 10% to the NPV and push this up about 2%. So uh, obviously a significant benefit. And one of the key drivers, because of the grade of this deposit, is costs are very low. They're down in the $600 uh, an ounce range. Now, uh, this database getting a little bit out of date, but the US doesn't update its data very often, so it's uh, hard to define. But, um, uh, you know, this picture hasn't really changed very much uh, since this was uh, published. 
But based on this data here, we would be between the fourth and sixth largest gold mine in the United States based on our production, the fourth based on the first four years, and sixth based on the life of mine. Got the 13th largest resource in the U.S., eighth largest reserve, but sizes and everything, grade counts. And so we got the fourth highest grade open pit in the United States, but this mine is shut down. It was very small scale anyway, and this one's supposed to shut down in the next year or so. Um, so you'd be pushing right up uh, very close to Cortez, which is Barrick's uh, star mine in Nevada. And this slide was really interesting. This was uh, put together by Northern Star when they bought the Pogo mine um, uh, just a couple of months ago. And basically what they said, okay, well, how many mines are there out there in the world that produce more than 300,000 ounces a year? And what's the geopolitical risk ranking of different countries? This is Fraser Institute ranking. Um, and there's only 18 mines in first world countries with ge low geopolitical risk that produce more than 300,000 ounces a year. And there's only five in the United States. So our project would be the sixth mine in the United States that produces more than 300,000 ounces a year. So having large scale, high quality uh, mines in geopolitically stable environments is um, you know, the pretty rare commodity. There's less than 20 in the world um, uh, available out there. And most of those are obviously owned by majors. So I mentioned antimony uh, briefly. What is antimony? It's primarily used as a flame retardant. Uh, so this is just an illustration using coveralls. But any synthetic uh, material made of plastic, you don't want it to burn. Well, what's plastic made of? It's made of oil. Um, it catches fire, and it'll burn like this. So you treat it, and it basically stops it burning. And as soon as you, uh, a simple way to test this is you, um, you, know, you have copper wire, a uh, piece of copper wire with that pla colored plastic insulation. If you put a match on the end of it, you know, the plastic starts to burn. You take the match away, it goes out right away. The, ra the reason it goes out, of the way goes out and stops burning is because of the antimony in it. So all this building, all the copper wire in here, the insulation uh, has antimony in it because if one of these light bulbs sparks, instead of it burning the building down, it just melts the plastic and it stops burning the carpet. Uh, you're standing on, the foam in your chairs, anything like that that uh, you don't want to burn. Uh, you use antimony as a flame retardant. The U.S. uses more for other categories as well, but globally it's about two-thirds of production is fl flame retardant because um, they use some specialized uh, other uses as well. Um, but uh, what impact does it have? Besides economics, both Europe and the United States have declared this a critical mineral. Um, and so it re receives a lot of political attention uh, because of China's dominance of this product. So they mine 75% of the world's antimony, but they have 90% of the world's refining capacity. And the other major suppliers are places not particularly friendly to the U.S. either, like Russia and Tajikistan, uh, Bolivia. Um, and so there's, uh, the, China, the U.S. is 100% dependent on countries they don't consider friendly to the United States. So there's a lot of interest in seeing domestic production made available. So where, where would investors uh, have opportunities to, to see value created? Well, essentially, there's sort of three major focus areas. One is simply we have a lot of gold. And so as gold price goes up, um, you know, the value of the project goes up. So this just provides benchmarking for you to look at, you know, pick whatever gold price you like, and you can sort of work out roughly what is the value per share uh, of the company. Obviously, we don't control gold price, so um, you know, that's just there as leverage to gold. Um, what we do have a greater influence on is permitting. And this is an example of um, companies. Uh, what happens is you move through the permitting into construction, into operation. That you know, essentially what you happens when you're over here is you trade at a discount because how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost until you get permitted? Uh, once you're permitted, now you've got to build it. Is that going to work? Or you get a discount? And you basically get your discount reduced as you go towards production. And so over the next few years, our aim is to go up this curve by uh, de-risking the project. And what does that do from a value perspective? This was, I think, Hayward analysis. And it basically said, you know, this is how many ounces of gold per year you produce in thousands. And this is the market capitalization of the company. And it's actually a surprisingly tight correlation. And so we would be producing 340,000 ounces a year. So theoretically, we should head over into here somewhere. Uh, and that's the revaluation opportunity uh, for investors as we move forward uh, through this process. The other way, the third way, which we have the greatest control on, is um, to make the project itself worth more money. 
Um, so how do we do that? As I mentioned at the, earlier, we did a pre-feasibility study in 2014, and there was an $800 million MPV there. You know, with the lower tax rate, yeah, that goes up another 10% kind of thing. But you step back to 2012, we did a PEA there. And why did the NPV of the PEA go down? Well, it wasn't CapEx. It didn't blow out or anything like that. CapEx was basically flat. We sold a royalty to Franco. Well, we can't do anything of that. That's gone. Metal prices went down. We can't control that. So kind of these, you know, either done or can't be controlled. But 70% of the reduction of the NPV was these two factors. This was essentially higher operating cost, and it was basically related to um, metallurgy. So post this study, and the data will be used in the feasibility study, we've done a significant amount of additional metal, metallurgical work all the way to bankable level, and we'll re more than recover this value. We've already announced the results of that metallurgy. Uh, we've got higher recoveries, uh, coarser grinding, lower reagents, uh, various things like that, and we will more than recover that. So that will get added back on to the, the present value of the project. Obviously, the biggest chunk is less metal. Why do you have less metal? Well, the primary driver is here you can use inferred resources. Here you can't. So there's a million ounces less in this mine plan than this mine plan. But what's the solution to that is you go drill. And as I showed you that resource update uh, earlier, and that updated resource involves a lot of conversion uh, of, re uh, of inferred to indicated. So the amount of gold in the mine plan will go up. The strip ratio will go down because you converted resource inferred uh, to, to indicated, and now it's to be used, et cetera. So uh, we'll see some wins coming from that as well. Um, so, so I should have mentioned, so the wins are, you know, we're going to get this back, we're going to get a chunk of this back, and then the taxes uh, will be significantly helpful. You know, going for the rest of it, obviously the potential risks um, and pressures is CapEx is definitely has pressure because labor costs in the U.S. are going up because you've got a booming U.S. economy. Um, so that's going to put some pressure here. Obviously, we're going to try and mitigate that. And the second thing is the steel tariffs. We use a lot of steel in construction. Uh, that's putting uh, uh, pressure on steel costs. Steel costs we're able to mitigate to some extent because the metallurgical work that I talked about here, we're more efficient, therefore the tank sizes are smaller, therefore there's less steel in them, and because the tanks are smaller, the building is smaller, which means less steel. So there will be some mitigating things for steel, but you know, we're definitely currently focused on this. We're very positive we can drop this, we're very positive we can get that, we know the tax is there, you know, this is the area we're going to really have to pay attention to. Um, Beyond what we have, and, and a challenge of U.S. permitting, is U.S. permitting, you cannot change your project footprint while you are permitting. If you do, you have a substantial risk they will make you start all over again. So basically, once you start the permitting process, you stop exploring. So we've shut down exploration for the last couple of years. Um, however, there is a tremendous amount of potential. Yeah, we've got 6.5 million ounces already. That's basically in these areas sitting here. But all of these deposits are open to expansion. Um, they've all drilled. We have hundreds and hundreds of drill holes in these areas, which show these deposits continue out. Uh, for example, and then we have all these other prospects, which have you know, a substantial amount of work. For example, this area here, there's 200 drill holes already in there. Uh, it's not part of a resource. This one has uh, 95, 97 drill holes in, not part of a resource. This one has 30. This one has about 20. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are lots of areas where we're very confident that we will be able to add to the resource, add to the mine life. Some of it's particularly high grade and similar to what Gabriella was just talking about. You know, this one, for example, the average grade is about 8 grams a ton there, you know, versus 1.6 grams in the open pit. It's near surface underground. Basically, you could see it in the side of the hill. You know, it could provide some supplementary high-grade feed that will help drop your operating cost. So, um, you know, this will all pick up. Uh, when, as soon as we have our permits, we'll be back at expiration looking to add to the resource. The last thing to talk about, then, is permitting. So this is an unusual situation because... Uh, this is a rare situation where a, a, a mine redevelopment is helping environmental problems. Well, and why were there environmental problems? Well, this was an operating mine uh, for off and on for 80 years. Uh, there were open pits, uh, there was towns, um, there was mill, there was a smelter. All of these things were on site. And during um, 
the 1920s through the 1950s, particularly the, 19, well, particularly the 1940s and 50s, uh, this was really driven by the strategic need for antimony and tungsten, which was also a byproduct, where this mine produced 90% of all the antimony required and two-thirds of the tungsten for the entire U.S. war effort. And so it's very important. Uh, you were exempt from military service if you worked here. Um, but what happened afterwards? Uh, they stopped buying antimony and tungsten. Metal prices went down. The mine shut down. And they just walked away and left it. So this is a, a tributary of the Salmon River running through here. It runs right through an open pit and through all these waste dumps. This is all tailings that were just dumped unconstrained into the valley. Um, they've got high levels of arsenic and antimony. Fish are cut off. And you can see that in this picture here. That's the river running right through all the waste dumps and the pit. Salmon haven't been able to get past here since 1938. Um, so what is the opportunity? It's basically to remediate and fix all of these problems in conjunction with the redevelopment of the mine. So what essentially happens is this is what it's like now. Um, we basically mine out the rest of the ore, and then we start backfilling the pit with ore from uh, waste from over here, and we backfill it, and then we rebuild the river. And so for the first time since 1938, salmon will be able to migrate upstream uh, all the way up into the headwaters, and there's about uh, 30 miles of headwaters up here, uh, which currently have no salmon, and we'll be able to bring them back up and um, increase the salmon population. What does that do? It gives you a social license. Social license is support of the community, and this really illustrates that social license. The Idaho State Legislature, um, the leadership of both houses, both Democrats and Republicans on both sides, sponsored uh, a, a resolution to be, go to the President of the U.S. and all of the federal administrators, and the, uh, et cetera, that they support this project and get on and get it done. When the vote went to the table, it was 104 to 105 in support of the project. So very strong uh, support from the state uh, for this project. The governor of Idaho was in uh, Toronto and New York with us uh, talking about uh, the state's support for mining uh, during uh, the fall this year. And you can see that here. This is independent third party polling. So we've got about 75% of the population. You know, if you take a typical area, it would be about 50 50 split. Um, but we're basically picking up a significant number of people who don't particularly like mining generally, but they like this project because we're cleaning up the environment. The one challenge in when you switch geopolitical, you eliminate geopolitical risk by coming to the U.S., you take on a much more burdensome permitting process. And the U.S. process is pretty fragmented. There's lots of agencies at three levels of government. But what Idaho has, which is unique, is what's called a joint review process, which can, which can be triggered at the request of the governor of the state. So it has been in September 2017. And what it does is create an umbrella where all these agencies now coordinate under a single process. So legally, they're separate processes, but practically, they all work together on a single process. What happens with that? Um, you have less risk of the process getting you know, off track, but you have, you're now trying to herd cats all in the same direction. So it kind of tends to add time, and, I'll, and you'll see that here. So we started permitting in 2016, late 2016. Um, you know, we're sort of now here, um, and this time frame has essentially slipped by about six months since we started this permitting process. And it's basically not because there's big issues or pushbacks, it's the time to get coordinated. You know, in this modern age, every agency should be able to get online and look at the same document at the same time and put all their comments in uh, uh, together. But of course, it doesn't do like that. They don't do it like that. So this guy sends it to that guy. That guy sends it to that guy. That guy sends it to that guy. And it just goes on and on and on. And you know, and instead of taking a week to get it, it takes a month. And so you've just seen creep um, coming into this process uh, through, here, through that uh, type of agency coordination challenges. But we're heading down through, uh, here. The final record of decision is currently scheduled for Q2. Uh, 2020, so call that 18 months from now. Um, you know, is there risk to this time frame? There's always risk, but I would characterize that risk as creep, as opposed to significant delays. So, it, you know, does it take an extra few months, uh, possibly? But once we get to the end of that, we'll have, you know, permitted uh, one of the largest, uh, highest grade 
lowest cost gold mines in a geopolitically low risk environment with strong community support. And we have major backers who want to see this project developed, who can write the checks uh, to see this mine built. Um, so that's kind of the highlights of the story. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we've got a very compelling investment story and happy to answer any questions after this is over. Thank you.